Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for being here. It's, um, it's, it's always uh, a pleasure to be at AEI. It's especially heartwarming uh, to be able to speak about two of my favorite things, social connectedness and federalism, and have people actually show up uh, at, at 8.30 a.m. On, on a Wednesday when people have a, a lot of perfectly other good things to do. So uh, uh, thank you for being here. Um, I'm honored to talk about localism, uh, also with, with such thoughtful scholars. Yuval, Lee, Joel, and Scott, I of course expect you back at the office within 15 minutes after your panel is finished. The other week, I stumbled across something interesting uh, that I think illustrates some of the challenges facing communities in America today. It was from CNBC. And uh, paraphrasing Mark Zuckerberg, uh, uh, CNBC reported, Facebook can play a role that churches and Little League once filled. Zuckerberg was, of course, celebrating an important, an important milestone for his social media platform. It now has 2 billion monthly users. But I was struck by how he described those users in his speech, which was titled, bringing the world closer together. He called the Facebook user base a community, a community that happens to be 2 billion users strong. As Silicon Valley lingo goes, this term is not that objectionable. And the use of this term in this circumstance isn't that strange. In fact, it's kind of endearing. It speaks to a deep-seated recognition that community is good and that man was not meant to live alone. But words do matter. And a group of 2 billion people is not really a community in any meaningful sense of that word. 2 billion people isn't even a mass movement. In the year 1930, it was the total population of the planet we occupied. It doesn't make sense to describe 2 billion people as a community because a community is all about a collection of human interpersonal relationships. And you can only have so many of those. Uh, as they say, if everyone is family, then no one is. In fact, the limited nature of community is one of the reasons community is so very valuable. Membership in a community helps to make the impersonal mass society in which we live much more manageable and ultimately much more human. And so while Facebook can help connect us with friends, and family, and cat videos. It's not a true community. Community institutions like churches and like little leagues can't be replaced by the glowing rectangles that we keep in our pockets that we sometimes seem to check obsessively. Rather, community is the stage where we perform the most rewarding roles in our lives as children and parents, as siblings, as spouses, as friends, as mentors and disciples. Strong communities surround us uh, with the supporting cast members, uh, each of whom can help us in those roles. Moreover, they prepare young people to take on these challenging roles as they grow. Strong communities instruct us in our early years, and they support us thereafter. Weak communities, by contrast, are something of an empty stage, an empty stage where individuals perform in the glare of the spotlight, forced to improvise their roles without accompaniment and without support. Which leads to a very important question. How strong are America's communities today? Recently, we started a multi-year research effort within the Joint Economic Committee called the Social Capital Project to study this very question. In May of this year, we released our first report titled, What We Do Together, The State of Associational Life in America. Drawing on decades of social science research, the report found that American communities are growing weaker. Now, here's some of what we found. This will not come as a surprise to many of you, but American families look quite different than they did just a few decades ago. And in many respects, American families are worse off. Men and women are having fewer children in total, and they're also having fewer children within wedlock. Between 1970 and 2015, 
Births to single mothers rose from 11% of all births to 40%. A majority of American children can now expect to live with just one parent at some point during their lives. Americans are spending less time in religious communities, which Robert Putnam called, quote, the single most important repository of social capital in America. Church attendance and trust in organized religion have dropped sharply since the 1970s. Americans also are participating a lot less in secular voluntary associations, such as Boy Scouts and Rotary International, groups that historically have brought Americans together from all different walks of life. And we increasingly uh, are, are finding ourselves segregated on the basis of class or uh, at least some type of socioeconomic status. As AEI's own Charles Murray has pointed out, upper middle class professionals have insulated themselves from their fellow countrymen by moving into neighborhoods of immense privilege. It should surprise no one that the largest cluster of these affluent neighborhoods uh, can be found right in and around Washington, D.C. The Social Capital Project's report paints a concerning picture of American community life. It finds that strong communities increasingly are a class prerogative rather than a common inheritance, one that people can re reliably expect to have in their lives. The destruction of community life is a spiritual crisis for millions of our fellow citizens. These Americans live among their neighbors, but living among them in this case doesn't necessarily mean living with them. They've been severed from local institutions that give meaning and purpose to the human soul and that uh, affect, uh, if we allow them to, our lives in a very real personal way. So what caused this? Where did this come from? Why did it happen? There are, of course, a lot of culprits. But I contend that much of the blame goes, like many other things, to the government, which has intruded into aspects of life that used to be the sole domain of Americans' robust institutions of civil society. It's no coincidence that federal power has expanded at exactly the same time that American communities have started to come apart. The trends are related, and in fact, they tend to reinforce one another. When government grows, civil society recedes. When government flexes its muscle, the muscle of civil society tends inevitably to atrophy. Just to give one recent example, according to AEI researcher Ryan Wil uh, uh, Bradford Wilcox, almost one third of Americans report that they personally know someone who has not gotten married for fear of losing a means-tested government benefit. Think about what that means, that your relationship with an impersonal, massive government entity would cause you to change a decision about something as important as that. So government welfare policy is discouraging marriage, which is the bedrock of healthy societies, not to mention upward mobility, and the pursuit of happiness, not to mention that it's one of the greatest sources of happiness for human beings throughout Earth. Government crowds out civic groups by competing with them to perform similar social functions, to perform functions once provided uh, by institutions of civil society. Robbed of purpose by a competitor that they cannot outspend, that they can't really compete with in many respects, these civic groups start to wither, leaving behind an empty public square. This in turn provides yet another pretext for state intervention, and so government expands again, fueled by the dead timber of civil society. The timber having been killed and then dried out is just fuel to keep that fire burning. We observed this in the early 20th century with the decline of a number of fraternal societies, groups that provided their mostly working class members with everything from life insurance to companionship to health care. The welfare state supplanted these local lodges over a few decades. As one member wrote, his order, quote, lost a strong argument 
for recruiting members when the government started providing very similar services. But government does not just compete with civil society in the material realm through the provision of welfare. It competes also in the spiritual realm by offering individuals alternative visions of community, political identities that tend to bypass local affections. As the great scholar Roger, uh, Robert Nisbet observed, men and women hunger for community, and they will go looking for it when they do not find it in any place that's close to home. Nisbet noted that for many people, quote, this same quest terminates in the political party or action group. We can see this today in national protest movements that are reacting to the centralized winner-take-all nature of federal elections and of federal policy making. These mass movements give participants the feelings we sometimes associate with community, namely a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose, a sense of, of deeply rooted meaning. But they instill these feelings on the cheap. Attending marches, signing petitions, and posting indignantly on Facebook are no substitute for the hard work of building real communities in our real lives with real other human beings who we actually know. Putnam perhaps said it best, quote, from the point of view of social connectedness, the Environmental Defense Fund and a bowling league are just not in the same category, close quote. Mass movements are designed to affect change at the highest levels of government, but they're ill-suited for the human-sized problems of everyday life. They do not take care of the neighborhood kids during a family emergency. They do not bring groceries to the shut-in down the street. And so when partisans leave their rallies, they often return to communities as barren and as inhospitable as before whether they're wearing Make America Great Again hats or some type of pink knit hat. America is investing its energy in national politics, and in many cases, little more than commentary about national politics, even as it's withdrawing from its local communities where citizens' power to create change is of orders of magnitude greater. Most social media activism hurling hashtags and retweeting insults from late night comedians is not in fact real engagement. It's like fantasy football. It borrows some data points, it borrows uh, from some of the uh, entertaining superficialities of the real thing, but without the stakes, without the sacrifices, without the genuine team teamwork and the true rewards of the human endeavor. The challenge we face today is rebuilding our real communities, which will require us to uh, reverse a centrally, uh, century old trend toward centralization. We need to turn our gaze away from Washington, D.C., back to where we came from, back from our starting point, a starting point in which robust institutions of civil society were not only the norm, but also formed the bedrock of who we are. If we accept the premise that improving the lives of our neighbors and of our neighborhoods is someone else's problem, some politician, some bureaucrat, far off in Washington, D.C., then the battle is already lost. That's not to say government plays no role, or even necessarily a small role. Rather, it's to recognize that government only works in America as the people's servant and not as our master. This is a daunting challenge. That certainly doesn't admit of easy solutions. A commitment to localism will require hard work. In the short run, it'll seem less emotionally satisfying than the status quo. The stakes may well seem smaller, the reforms less sweeping and less urgent, the opposition less villainous. But this is also why, unlike our current season of outrage, a turn toward localism stands a chance of actually succeeding, of yielding a happier, healthier republic. Put another way, I believe that if we aim for subsidiarity, we'll get positive change not only in City Hall, but in Washington too. If we continue to aim instead for centralization, we will get neither. Let me explain why. First of all, 
a renewed focus on local governance would lower the stakes of political conflict in a very refreshing and necessary way. Everyone in this room is aware of the toxic uh, kind of partisanship that we have seen in this country in the last few years. Our national politics resembles a tribal feud with Hatfields and McCoys nursing ancient grudges against one another. Each new transgression is defended by invoking old transgressions by the rival clan. This is not what American politics is supposed to be about. It's not how we should view and treat our fellow beings, especially our fellow American citizens. The American system was carefully designed to avoid this sort of thing, to accommodate our differences, not pit them against one another in a sort of cage match. Peaceful accommodation would be possible once again if we returned to the state and local levels. Decisions made at lower levels of government are more likely to be consensus decisions, given the shared values within most communities. When problems arise within communities, local politicians are better situated to hear the concerns of those affected by their decisions, of their voters, of their stakeholders. Their accountability is positive, both for politicians who, who can make better informed judgments, and for citizens who can have a more direct stake in the concerns they're raising and a more direct channel to communicate those concerns to elected officials. And we should not discount the sheer civilizing effect that proximity tends to have. As Alexis de Tocqueville wrote, quote, the passions that commonly embroil society change their character when they find event so near the domestic hearth and the family circle, close quote. In other words, we can get away with shouting at our opponents in all kinds of caps on Twitter, but living in a community with others matters, and it in particular requires good manners. This is important, and this is something from which we can all benefit today. A renewed focus on local governance should also encourage innovation and public policy. States are referred to as laboratories of democracy, but often they're not free to experiment with policy solutions because the federal government imposes one solution from above, leaving them not laboratories, but lab rats themselves being tested upon by a federal overseer. This is a very risky way to make policy. Top-down solutions are an all-or-nothing bet of sorts, with catastrophic results for millions in the case of failure. Federalism offers a better way here as well. It offers states the opportunity to tailor policies to their diverse residents and to their respective cultures. Take my home state of Utah, for example. You may not know it, but Utah has had success in alleviating poverty while maintaining a small, conservative state government. The state spends little per capita on public welfare, yet its largest population center has the highest level of economic mobility in the country. 10.8% of Salt Lake City children born into the bottom quintile of the economic ladder will rise to the top quintile within their lifetimes. This impressive rate rivals the economic mobility of Denmark, which is often pointed to as the model of big government policies. Utah has accomplished this feat by understanding its unique strengths and its limitations. Thanks in large part to oppressive federal land policies, Utah has comparatively low fiscal capacity, which means it would have to levy painfully high taxes in order to fund big government programs. On the other hand, Utah is blessed with tight-knit communities. These communities are uh, communities that tend in many cases to be oriented around the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, whose moral instruction and charitable network help low-income members become self-sufficient. Utah's success in fighting poverty may not be something that can be replicated easily in other states, but honest observers would conclude that it's found a, a responsible small government strategy that meets our needs. Other states should be free to try different policies and to learn about what works and what doesn't work from their neighbors. I certainly hope more states look to Utah as a model for responsible leadership, as a model for maintaining vibrant communities. But there's one more reason why we need a renewed commitment to local governance in America. 
It has to do with something at the very core of our national project, self-government. Earlier, I mentioned the anger that's fueling so much of American politics today. On the left and right, populist movements are marching on Washington, demanding change. Many of their members are motivated by a sense of loss. They do not think their leaders care about them or that their concerns are being taken seriously. Crucially, they do not feel like they are in control of their own government. Rather, they feel like their government is in control of them. This only fuels the fire. This loss of control is an indignity, a reversal of the American social compact, which puts the people in charge. And it began with the decline of self-governing local communities that give meaningful roles to ordinary men and women. Seen in this light, localism is a way to restore dignity to the forgotten Americans, to our fellow citizens who haven't caught every break or maybe never will, but who are devoted parents, who are trusted neighbors, and who are strong pillars within their respected communities. As usual, Tocqueville put it best. He wrote that, quote, the township at the center of the ordinary relations of life serves as a field for the desire of public esteem, close quote. Alexis de Tocqueville understood that men and women desire esteem and that for the vast majority of people, esteem is earned close to home and it's earned through service to others close to home. That is the true beauty of localism. Hundreds of years after the founding, it still offers our country the best way forward. Thank you for having me here today. I look forward to hearing from the panelists and, and uh, to learning what they have to say about this very important topic. Thanks a lot.